Drawing Out the Facts, the Naked Science Scrapbook. Hello and welcome to the Naked Science Scrapbook from the Naked Scientists. This time we're answering the question, what is an alloy? Almost every piece of metal we use in our daily lives is an alloy, whether it's the wheels of our cars, the cutlery we eat with, or even the jewellery we wear. But what are alloys and how are they made? Alloys are essentially mixtures of a base metal and one or more additional elements. Combining metals like this produces a material with very different properties to the individual metals on their own. And this technology isn't new. In fact, humans have been making and using alloys for thousands of years. The very earliest example is bronze, an alloy of copper and tin, that started being produced around 5,000 years ago. Adding tin to the copper reduces the melting point and results in a stronger, harder product that's easier to cast and is better for turning into tools and weapons than copper on its own. After its discovery, the benefits of bronze meant that its use was so widely adopted that it gave its name to that era of human history, the Bronze Age. Another example of an alloy is solder, a low melting point alloy of lead and tin that's used to connect components on electronic circuit boards and to join copper pipes together around the house. And where strength is a priority, steel, which is a mixture of iron and carbon with trace amounts of a few other metals, is hard to beat. Alloying can also prevent metals from corroding. Stainless steel, which is made by mixing steel and chromium, is protected from corrosion by a thin layer of chromium oxide that forms on the surface. And because it won't rust, it can be used for anything from cutlery to car parts. Another important use of alloys today is in turbine blades for the jet engines that power the aeroplanes that take us on holiday. Nickel-aluminium alloys have been used for this purpose since Frank Whittle's earliest designs in the 1940s, because nickel is light and has a high melting point, meaning it can withstand the high temperatures inside the engine. The added aluminium also makes the alloy lighter and stronger. But why should adding a small amount of another element alter the properties of a metal so dramatically? It's all down to changes that happen between the atoms in the alloy. To see why adding aluminium to nickel makes this alloy stronger, let's take a look at what happens on an atomic level. First of all, this is the molecular structure of a metal. It forms a regular crystal lattice with planes of atoms all lined up neatly. You can also see similar crystal structures in grains of salt and in gemstones like quartz. Sometimes when you melt and then re-solidify a metal, the planes of atoms don't quite all line back up again, giving an extra half plane. This is called dislocation. As the atoms are all so close together, it's possible for the bonding of different planes to shift. If this shift continues, then the dislocation spreads along the metal until it reaches an edge, where it creates a deformation in the metal's shape. This is in fact what's happening when you bend a piece of metal. Alloying can stop this dislocation from spreading, making an alloy harder than the metal on its own. Let's look at the lattice structure of an alloy where some of the base metal atoms have been replaced with atoms from the added element known as the solute. The solute atoms will have different bonding properties to the atoms of the base metal and can either repel or attract the end of the extra half plane, helping to hold it in place, stopping the dislocation in its tracks. This increased hardness is why much of our modern gold jewellery is not pure gold, which would be far too soft, but in fact alloys of gold, with metals like copper, palladium or nickel added to increase the strength and durability of the pieces. Another way to stop dislocations from spreading through an alloy is to make sure it's made up of as many tiny crystals as possible by cooling them quickly once they've been cast. The joins between the crystals, which are known as grain boundaries, act like walls that stop the dislocations spreading through the alloy, making it stronger. This is used to harden the aluminium alloys that make up the alloy wheels in cars. However, at the high temperatures found in a jet engine, these grain boundaries can be a problem. As the turbine spins at high speed, atoms in the alloy can diffuse through the lattice to the outer edge, making the blades stretch outwards, away from the centre. This process is called creep deformation. If the blade was made up of lots of crystals, the diffusing atoms could take shortcuts along the grain boundaries, accelerating the creep process. 
So, turbine blades are made so that they're formed of just one giant crystal. This means there are no grain boundaries, so that the atoms diffuse much more slowly and there's less creep. So grain boundaries can be good or bad, depending on what you're planning to do with your alloy. Another property of alloys that can also be good or bad is the uneven distribution of the additional elements throughout the base metal. As an alloy solidifies, the additional elements, the solutes, become less soluble in the base metal. So you end up with crystals of base metal suspended in an increasingly concentrated solute liquid. It's a bit like trying to freeze seawater. As the water freezes into ice, the water left over becomes more and more salty. This can be a good thing and is exploited in some aluminium alloys and steels to block dislocations and improve strength. But it can also be a problem, and in these cases the alloy is reheated slightly to encourage the solutes to be more evenly distributed. So, we make alloys to change the properties of metals to suit the jobs we need them for. We can change the way the crystal lattices of alloys behave to alter hardness, strength and melting point. Predicting what properties different combinations of base metals and solute will have, however, is still pretty difficult, and current practice is still based on what we know about the properties of current existing alloys. But researchers are now developing complex computer models that are helping us to develop even stronger and more efficient alloys for the future. That's it for this time. To get the answers to more science questions, join us online at thenakedscientist.com forward slash scrapbook. Bye!